Today we are going to be examining the passage on Icarus and Daedalus, which follows the Minotaur myth in Ovid's Metamorphosis. We have reason to examine this, as I've pointed out in the last few videos, for it is the animating metaphor of Kubrick's first, last, and only speech, the acceptance speech for the D.W. Griffith Award. Before we begin, I thought it fitting to quote another part of Kubrick's speech, which will perhaps console those of us who are struggling to comprehend the nature of the phenomenon surrounding Kubrick's work. Early in their speech, Kubrick says, but at the same time, anyone who has ever been privileged to direct a film also knows that, although it can be like trying to write War and Peace in a bumper car at an amusement park, when you finally get it right, there are not many joys in life that can equal the feeling. There's a great deal going on here that we intuitively smile and nod at as if we understand instantaneously what Kubrick is saying. If we go just one level deeper, it looks as if Kubrick is trying to tell us something about the creation process of his filmography's puzzle language, not just about movie making in general, which must be very difficult in its own right. However, the process of encoding must have compounded the stress of the experience. So if we have a hard time expressing our findings and experience the limitations of plain English to express the detection of the phenomenon, I think we should be in part comforted by this admission from Kubrick. If we think it is hard decoding this filmography and giving voice to it, what do we imagine it was like to encode it? I think this raises an interesting question from a cryptographic perspective. Is it always the case that the encoding of messages is as or more difficult than the decode process? Intuitively, encoding appears more difficult if you are creating a self-consistent cipher that legislates how things ought to be. However, it is perhaps easier if a method has been handed down and you merely plug and play. All right, so the second order of business In several videos, we've covered the impact one of Kubrick's Columbia professors had upon the filmmaker and culture at large. As many of you know, I'm working through James Frazier's The Golden Bough, mostly because I know how important the work was to Kubrick. A viewer alerted me that Lionel Trilling very publicly endorsed the text as well, leaving us to ponder if Kubrick learned of The Golden Bough via Trilling. Trilling is recorded as saying the following in Marjorie Garber's The Muses on Their Lunch Hour. Lionel Trilling declared that perhaps no book has had so decisive effect upon modern literature as Frazier's. I asked myself, wrote Trilling, what books of the age just preceding ours had most influenced our literature? Or what older books might seem to fall into a line, the direction of which pointed to our own literature? It was virtually inevitable that the first work that should have sprung to mind was Sir James Frazier's The Golden Bow. Not, of course, the whole of it, but certain chapters, those that deal with Osiris, Attis, and Adonis. Anyone who thinks about modern literature in a systematic way takes for granted the great part played in it by myth, and especially by those examples of myth which tell about gods dying and being reborn. The imagination of death and rebirth re reiterated in the ancient world in innumerable variations that are yet always the same captivated the literary mind. All right, announcement three. I managed to listen on Audible to Ovid's The Art of Love, and it was quite interesting. My attention was directed here by the cryptic exchange between Sandor and Alice in Eyes Wide Shut. That will be for another video one day. But what I found relevant to our current topics is that Ovid rehearses the Ariadne and Theseus story from the female perspective. Also, Ovid nearly replicates the Icarus and Daedalus story from Metamorphosis, which we will be considering today. All right, so let's get into the passage of concern from Ovid's Metamorphosis. I thought about 
analyzing every single line like I did in the last video on the Minotaur. However, this time around, I think it would be best to read the entire passage through and summarize what I believe are at least two levels of meaning that we can derive from Kubrick's inclusion of the myth in his D.W. Griffith acceptance speech. So this is book eight, lines 185 through 235, the Daedalus and Icarus story. It's really beautiful. And you think you know it, but the details, that's, that's where the action is. Meanwhile, Daedalus, hating Crete and his long exile and filled with a desire to stand on his native soil, was imprisoned by the waves. He may thwart our escape by land or sea, he said, but the sky is surely open to us. We will go that way. Minos rules everything, but he does not rule the heavens. So saying, he applied his thought to new invention and altered the natural order of things. He laid down lines of feathers, beginning with the smallest, following the shorter with longer ones, so that you might think they had grown like that on a slant. In that way, long ago, the rustic pan pipes were graduated with lengthening reeds. Then he fastened them together with thread at the middle and beeswax at the base. And when he had arranged them, he flexed each one into a gentle curve so that they imitated real birds' wings. His son Icarus stood next to him and not realizing that he was handling things that would endanger him, caught laughingly at the down that blew in the passing breeze and softened the yellow beeswax with his thumb and in his play hindered his father's marvelous work. When he had put the last touches to what he had begun, the artificer balanced his own body between the two wings and hovered in the moving air. He instructed the boy as well saying, let me warn you Icarus to take the middle way in case the moisture weighs down your wings. If you fly too low, or if you go too high, the sun scorches them. Travel between the extremes. And I order you not to aim towards Butes the herdsman or Hellas the great bear or towards the drawn sword of Orion. Take the course I show you. At the same time, as he laid down the rules of flight, he fitted the newly created wings on the boy's shoulders. While he worked and issued his warnings, the aging man's cheeks were wet with tears the father's hands trembled. He gave a never to be repeated kiss to his son and lifting upwards on his wings, flew ahead anxious for his companion, like a bird leading her fledglings out of a nest above into the empty air. He urged the boy to follow and showed him the dangerous art of flying, moving his own wings and then looking back at his son. Some angler catching fish with a quivering rod or a shepherd leaning on his crook or a plowman resting on the handles of his plow saw them perhaps and stood there amazed, believing them to be gods able to travel the sky. And now Samos, sacred to Juno, lay ahead to the left. Delos and Paros were behind them. Leventhos and Callum, rich in honey, to the right. When the boy began to delight in his daring flight and abandoning his guide, Drawn by desire for the heavens soared higher, his nearness to the devouring sun softened the fragrant wax that held the wings, and the wax melted it, melted. He flailed with bare arms, but losing his oar-like wings, could not ride the air. Even as his mouth was crying, his father's name, it vanished into the dark blue sea, the Icarian Sea, called after him. The unhappy father now no longer a father, shouted, Icarus, Icarus, where are you? Which way should I be looking to see you? Icarus, he called again. Then he caught sight of the feathers on the waves and cursed his inventions. He laid the body to rest in a tomb and the island was named Icaria after his buried child. So for those of you that are interested, I'm using A.S. Klein's translation 
which you can find on the UVA website. It's a hypertext that allows you to jump around and hopefully uh, you'll learn the correct way to pronounce some of these names that I've butchered. I'm not a classicist, but I think I did a good enough job that you get the idea. All right. So it seems like we have at least two levels of interpretation here that shift depending on who Kubrick is speaking to. So let's review what he said in his D.W. Griffith Award speech about the Icarus myth. It's about Griffith. If you guys don't know who D.W. Griffith is, and I'm not some sort of expert, he is most famous, I believe, for uh, um, making Birth of a Nation, which I've only watched like two thirds of. But he made like hundreds of films and is quite controversial if you know anything about the subject matter of that film. Okay. So it's curious, right? Like, I, I haven't figured this out, but it's very curious that Kubrick would, would be winning this award given the reputation. I, I don't know what it means. I haven't thought about it. I'm just musing aloud. He became an international celebrity and his patronage included many of the world's leading artists and statesmen of the time. But Griffith was always ready to take tremendous risks in his films and, his, and in his business affairs. He was always ready to fly too high. And in the end, the wings of fortune proved for him, like those of Icarus, to be made of nothing more substantial than wax and feathers. And like Icarus, when he flew too close to the sun, they melted. And the man whose fame exceeded the most illustrious filmmakers of today spent the last 17 years of his life shunned by the film industry he had created. I've compared Griffith's career to the Icarus myth, but at the same time, I've never been certain whether the moral of the Icarus story should only be as is generally accepted. Don't try to fly too high or whether it might also be thought of as forget the wax and feathers and do a better job on the wings. All right, so here's my analysis. Here's, I think, I think there are many layers of meaning in all of this. I think I just thought of another while I was reading that aloud, which I have not developed. So let's look at these two that I have prepared for you. The first here. Don't try to fly too high. I think this is directed towards us. If Stanley is Daedalus, then ought we to expect Kubrick to hate Crete and attempt an escape? In a way, we see this play out in the real life of Kubrick by his leaving America, flying across the ocean, only to never fly again, hanging up his wings after building his Apollonian temple. Fittingly, one of Kubrick's short films is entitled The Flying Padre, who provides spiritual sustenance to his far-flung flock. It appears among Kubrick's inventions is the puzzle language, prompting the question we've contemplated before, is this a type of technology that we can merge with in order to escape? If it is a technology, ought we to join ourselves so easily to it? When you think about it, the Daedalus myth is one of the most cherished transhuman narratives, artificially constructed wings with the appearance of nature, the marriage of man and machine. Daisy, Daisy, a bicycle built for two. Something I've mentioned in passing in several videos are the number of birds throughout Kubrick's work. Could it be at least partially that Kubrick is telling us we are going to need all kinds of feathers in order to build out the allegory? Eagles, roadrunners, bird is the word. Um, the loons from, uh, um, from The Shining, uh, Jupe Hawk Productions, uh, The Falcon Feather, Nick Nightingale from Eyes Wide Shut. Let's see if you can find that falcon feather. I think these birds have been included for a myriad of other reasons as well. 
Many of them seem to intersect with other emerging clue sets, so it is not my contention that they are solely present to point us toward and in some odd way participate in an ancient sub-narrative. If they are within Kubrick's work, at least in part, to direct us back to this detail of the Icarus Daedalus myth, what does it tell us about Kubrick's craft and intentions? At the very least, as if we didn't know, he has brain power to spare to think about embedding an untold number of mythical tales across his filmography. But why is he doing this? He doesn't have to go to such lengths to hide these details or include them at all. In fact, most of this work will be lost in the vast majority of his audience because that, because what they ultimately entail is too frightful. I've been thinking about this a good deal this week. What animates me to look into these matters is an intense desire to know, to scry some occulted truth that a mind like Kubrick either discovered or was invited to ponder and disseminate. It's quite possible and maybe even likely that outside of the big truth topics, there may be no new revelatory truth. I have not come to this conclusion yet, but if the case, then this would mean, for it not to be a wild goose chase, that this was the only way we were going to develop the skills for a perhaps formidable task of which I have only the faintest idea. I recently rewatched Full Metal Jacket and have been mulling over the words of Hartman. You will not laugh. You will not cry. You will learn by the numbers. I will teach you. Now get up, get on your feet. So I ask again, if the Kubrickian language does not necessarily disclose something about objective reality, is it rather a transformative mechanism for the few, the proud, the Marines? If true, who and what is the adversary? What are the obstacles that must be surmounted? I have some suspicions about what is going on here, but nothing I can speak on just yet. Getting back to the Icarus Deadly story, we have a very touching scene where Icarus plays with products of his father's hand, unaware of how they simultaneously represent his potential freedom or early demise. Kubrick's fans who merely appreciate him on an aesthetic level seem akin to Icarus in this scenario. When people only marvel at the aesthetic prowess, are they handling something potentially dangerous, something akin to a child playing with a weapon. Is this how Kubrick perhaps secretly viewed his work? Something of great power wielded in the right hands, but potentially destructive in others. If Kubrick is the artificer Daedalus here, I think it is safe to say that he's going to be subtle about what he includes in his work. Nothing too overt, or he will be scorched by the sun, or too low and weighed down by the moisture. But how does this advice get us out of imprisonment how would it have gotten Kubrick out of his imprisonment? What exactly is the nature of his and our imprisonment? Was Kubrick constrained by the system? Were his films a way to get information past the censors and therefore experience the freedom he so de desired? Or is there something more? Does his filmography aim at the emancipation of man that is perhaps unknowingly participating in a form of spiritual slavery? Further, what we can learn from the allegory is that it's not just about not flying too low or too high, but Daedalus gives very specific instructions in regards to the route. Kubrick appears to be laying down the rules for flight. Kubrick not having a son figuratively is teaching us how to fly. Like Hartman, he knows that we all will not come back from Nam or the mission. We need to not abandon our guide and do not desire the heavens. Meditext, don't obsess about space or you will die in the sea. Returning to the theme of transhumanism within the Daedalus and Icarus story, the merger of man and machine gives off the illusion of godlike status to those that perceive the father-son tandem. It's brought to mind the role of technology within Kubrick's art. Many, if not all, of Kubrick's fans appear to deify him, 
causing me to wonder if technology is enhancing Kubrick's status. This gets back to our interest in the role of computers in Kubrick's symbolic language. What will become of us should we master this alchemical tongue? At some point, will we no longer be perceived as human? All right, tier two. Forget the wax and feathers and do a better job on the wings. The basic occulted meaning of this has to do with Kubrick's role in altering the natural order of the heavens. Some will analogize the wax and feathers to the duct tape and aluminum foil used by perhaps the most infamous, yet ironically wingless, Bird of Jove. The whole narrative disintegrates when the sun god shines on these flimsy materials. This seems so patently obvious that it is hardly worth mentioning. Many other references are made to the Daedalus and Icarus myth across his extended filmography. It would prove a rewarding exercise to find them all. Perhaps begin with his convention of signaling with lunar craters, such as Clavius and Tycho. Let me know what you find. 